discussion on State Board of Ed resolution on Governor Snyder's budget. Um, it looks like John's going to lead that discussion. I guess when, um, when we take 10 minutes max to just talk this through uh, and see what it where it leaves us in terms of potential action this afternoon. Uh, Marilyn has mm -hmm. the latest, uh, and I know we, we are wanting to break and spend an hour uh, with Mike in uh, executive session to discuss his evaluation, so I, I want to make sure we have time to do that. But this is important. Uh, as you all know, and thank state board members, all of you, for your help with this. Um, it is uh, our job, uh, per the Constitution, to make recommendations to the governor and legislature on education uh, improvement, including the financial requirements uh, for what our schools need to deliver the education program that we recommend. So I think it is, uh, since we took that action in February with the family recommendations in terms of our priorities, uh, incumbent upon us to reflect on the budget that the governor has proposed as the legislature and all stakeholders are uh, reflecting upon it. And I think we, this draft, um, is an effort to say something potentially that we can say as a unanimous board, uh, knowing that there's differences of opinion uh, and priority on uh, whether there's enough money and on whether there's the right kinds of reforms. But I think what this attempts to do is to say two things. One is there's much in this budget that is in line with our recommendations um, around looking for shared sacrifice, for pushing for efficiencies and reforms, from our schools in key areas that we have supported as a board. And I think it, I, I think it is important to say that it, certainly in the context of the budget, uh, we'll talk about the financial manager legislation later, but in the context of the budget, the governor is uh, not um, seeking to end collective bargaining, but is encouraging resolution and cost cutting in the context of collective bargaining, which uh, in my view, and, and perhaps the rest of the board's view, is, is appropriate and helpful. Um, so we are saying that we endorse, uh, too, looking at the whole continuum of pre-K through higher ed, as the board has done. Um, but w I think we're trying to say that as we look at the actual funding proposals, we're, we're not there yet in terms of delivering the uh, requisite resources, particularly, I would suggest, at the pre-K and the higher ed level, where the cuts proposed are significant. So this is an effort at a statement that reflects uh, appreciation and support for many of the contours of the budget and gives our encouragement that if we are serious about delivering the kind of elements that we have supported as a board, pre-K essentially available to all, uh, higher education that's robust enough to support higher education attainment and a, a, an appropriate level of K-12 support to deliver quality. And I know I, I, we made a couple changes in the last version in response to several additional comments. I know, Eileen, you had a couple wordsmithing comments that we can discuss. But also, Kathy and others, I know, want a stronger statement that the K-12 cuts of 400 plus are too much. And I think um, uh, some of us agree. Uh, some of us are uh, appreciating that for some districts that have made a lot of reforms and found a lot of efficiencies and changed their pension and health care systems, they are getting into the bone of um, expanding class sizes and cutting good teachers. But not all districts are in that position, and there's lots of reforms uh, and cost savings to be found by many districts. So it has become somewhat arbitrary. What is the money you need to deliver K-12 quality when some districts have made serious reforms and are uh, probably suffering uh, in quality with the cuts proposed? Others may have work to do to get there. So I, this may be the strongest statement we can make, and I encourage other board members to editorialize about their own points of view. I would like to see if we can make something together. If not, you know, I'm prepared to make a stronger statement if we need to as a, a Democratic majority, but I really think this represents the, it's the point of view of the board that good reforms, uh, more work to do to su provide the financial support to deliver the goods that we outline. Other yeah, Eileen, please. Yeah. Um, I respect uh, uh, Kathleen's concern, and I share it, uh, but I come from Ann Arbor, and uh, if I speak out for K-12, I'm going to have the University of Michigan saying, how can you tolerate what's happening to us? Um, it's hard. I know. I, 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 I think that if we can come up with a consensus statement, it's a powerful document, and I, I think it should be 
uh, something we, we want to have happen. I don't presume at any point that that precludes people doing an individual statement. Um, and Kathleen, uh, I, I have to include the cuts for everybody because of where I live and because of my sensibilities, but I, I understand the, the concern. Um, I think that if there were one thing that I would try to do with this, and I don't believe we can, it would be to point out that there are inequities in the blanket uh, system. Uh, and, but then we start getting into the problems we had with the foundation grant at the very beginning, you know, which is you, you institutionalize. Uh, some, some, found, some districts were able to get more money because they had higher millages. Mm -hmm. and so um, I, I, you know, I want to stay away from that because we're not setting policy. We're advocating for uh, 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 an equitable system that does what Michigan needs. And the wordsmithing I had on it was really very minor. Yep. It was um, w one concern that I had was when you say in the bullets um, protecting the quality of, of K through 12 that um, that in some cases we don't want to protect what's in place. And to say something like providing quality classroom instruction and direct educational services covered, I think, most of the needs that we had. That was, um, and then I also was curious as to whether we're actually, uh, is it a multi-year budget that's been proposed, a two-year budget? I know that there's three-year projections within this, but I don't know whether it's a binding budget for two years uh, or whether that's been changed. Well, I, I was proposing in response to Eileen's comments to change the two to four in the second bullet and we could uh, uh, replace protect in the third bullet with deliver. Uh, two to four, I guess I don't. You know, all day kindergarten similarly available for all children, not to all oh, children. I they happen the to be numbers too. also. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> it just happens to be that they're both numbers. And I was trying to be um, look for a way to be um, attentive to Kathy's good point in the third bullet that uh, we, we, we do want to see funding that allows, uh, that doesn't begin to diminish uh, the quality of, of the, what the teacher does in the classroom and frontline services. There's no way to say that uh, that's going to find universal agreement with all of us uh, because many of us think that the cuts proposed are too far and will diminish that. But this was an effort to say that's an important feature and um, to say deliver the quality of classroom instruction and direct educational services and we'll have to um, make, you know, make our own opinions of that known. Yes, please. Um, Kathy, please. I guess what, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I, oh, okay. I guess what I would like to see in that third bullet, when you say the quality of classroom instruction, and maybe I'm being picky here, not that I've ever done that before, but um, <laughs> what concerns me is that if you leave it in that, in that, with those terms, those people who've made the hard cuts certainly are recognized. Those people who haven't made the hard reforms or cuts within their district that need to be made they don't need to go there because you haven't defined this well enough. And so what I would like to do in an attempt to kind of um, showcase that we're looking for quality in classroom instruction and direct educational services is to say K-12 state aid at funding level sufficient to protect quality mm -hmm. classroom instruction yeah. and direct educational services. Because yeah. I think that's really what we're after. Is Quality classroom I'm instruction. Just take out the same two words. Yeah, would that yeah, that would, would that help. be acceptable? Because then help. then you know the hardest part of doing this is to allow a district then okay. to say, I guess I don't have to do anything because they think we can still get more money, and I don't want to do that. They're going to have to do something. Yeah. Yep. And let me just say on the Kathy. last. I'm sorry. Well, Kathy was next, and John. I'm concerned because I know that some districts have been very efficient about doing this. Some districts have not, and some districts have uh, contracts that are out of line, probably. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are going to be a lot of districts, from what I've been hearing, that will go into deficit with, this, with these cuts. And we're going to have a lot more deficit districts. And <coughs> granted, it's just, they're not it's one year, and maybe next year, every year we say maybe next year will be better, but so far it hasn't happened. So I'm worried that we're going to, there'll be an abundance of districts in deficit, and how are we going to deal with all these districts? It's, going to, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, and I think we have a, an obligation as a state board to point out that this is really, results require resources. 
They also and require wanting to do it. But, and I, I know what I know what the government is saying that, that if they did certain things, they would save the money, mm -hmm. and a lot of them will do that. Some of them might not, but the, I mean, everybody knows we're in, we're in trouble. But I I think that to say that we education, that the investment in education is we say we have said in our previous statement that education is. The investment in education is critical to the economic recovery of Michigan. And then we do we cut both K-12 and universities. And <coughs> at the same time we're saying, Richard might not agree, but we're saying everybody needs education beyond high school. Not necessarily a four-year college degree, but a two-year degree or a one-year technical training. And then we cut higher education. I mean, it, it, there's something very inconsistent with the, with the goals. And I think, Kathy, w w as written, we are saying that together in this statement, that we are not funding the investment in education writ large that we need. And I think that's a pretty strong statement from a bipartisan State Board of Education. Well, uh, let, me, let me suggest changing a couple of words in the last paragraph before the bullet points. Where we, you say we, the budget is proposed is not yet provided right financial requirements. I would say for the financial resources needed it makes it clearer. But we don't know that that's what it is. Here's the problem with doing that. If you go ahead and say resources, now you've given everybody free possibilities of just saying, well, all it is is money. We just need more money. And it isn't just more money. It needs to be that we change the way we do our work to realize the gains in money. And once we've done that, and if we still need more money, now we go back and we ask for additional resources. But until we've changed the way we do our work, I just don't believe that you can say unequivocally that it requires increased resources. And that's what I'm concerned about. Let's not Why argue. What, what else? Do, what, what other recommendations do people have? And let's get them out what? there, and then we can figure out what we do. Why do you say we're not doing our work? I didn't say that. I said no. I said we're going to change the way we do our work. Why do you say? Because I think that if we have not consolidated some services, if we haven't looked about how we can leverage the money we do have to use it in the best way possible. Now, when you say we, do you mean the? Education writ large. Okay. I, I mean it all. I mean everybody. Colleges, universities, departments, whatever. You know, I think that we really need to look carefully, clearly, about how we do our work and to see what savings can be realized through doing it differently. And then we can get at what kind of additional resources we have. But until we've done that, I just don't know how you assess that. So you don't think people have been doing that? I think no. some people have. I don't think all, in fact, I know not all of them have. I, I think we all know that. I think it was Eileen and then John. No, I just okay. wanted to encourage us. Let's share Eileen. things, language, things people feel strongly about, and then let's not end the, we'll see what we might revise over the mm -hmm. break and come back with some, would be my recommendation. And I hear and what Kathleen is saying. I also know that someplace between a broad uh, 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 document that describes our concerns is one page long and has um, considerable punch is really a good idea. I would also like to say that the schools and the districts have recourse through professional organizations to lobby the legislature in, the, in what's coming up next and all the discussions that are happening. Um, and I don't know of any way myself to state that this could be that a, that a consistent um, uh, allocation of cuts across the state uh, would be inequitable to some districts without making the whole statement start to flop. So, um, but I do believe they have recourse, and just as we've seen with the middle cities in my SAS, you know, there are certainly remedies that people can take, and they're aggressive about doing it. I don't think their voices will go unheard. Mary Ann was next. Um, I just wanted to clarify uh, in the third paragraph where we say uh, end reform of health care and pension systems. Is that a 
euphemism for taxes? No, it's a euphemism for the fact that uh, districts are being asked to uh, bargain uh, potentially changes in uh, health care and pension systems in order to um, basically save money and be more competitive. But um, it's not a reference to um, taxing the pension system. No, 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 no. I, uh, I support that fundamentally, but that, that is not in this statement anywhere. <coughs> All right, Lane. Just a wordsmith thing. Um, I, I see what uh, Marianne's asking about, and I'm wondering if what you want to say is to find greater efficiencies and cost savings, including reform of health care and pension systems. Or, or maybe to um, specify that it's for local districts. Schools and educational institutions. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other comments? Schools, maybe school districts, and pushing school districts to find greater efficiencies. Yeah. And, and any potential action wouldn't be till this afternoon anyway, so mm -hmm. for some reason it gels a little bit differently in your mind between now and then. Is that right? But, mm -hmm. You know, this brings up the whole question of the, um, the, the way we fund the schools. When are we going to look at that and when are we going to talk about that? Maybe we should be making recommendations to the governor about that for his budget, for his education message, because proposal A needs changing, and we have not really tackled that. And I think maybe we should. By the way, I don't think his intent is is anything on the money side in April. It's it's reform issues. I haven't had any participation in the budget stuff. I have had some participation, as you know, on the reform stuff, and they're intended to be separate. He has certainly the prerogative to change that, so maybe I'm jumping out ahead oh, here, okay, but I've just so mentioned. when would be a good time for us to talk about or learn about or look at, at, at or do pleasure. something with the way we at, at, at your pleasure. I was only trying to say you wouldn't have to beat an April deadline because it wouldn't be in that anyway, but at your pleasure when you'd like to discuss that more and possibly come up with that. Some of our recommendations do speak to that, and not as fully as we did last year, um, and oh, we I should re resurrect some of that, certainly. Okay. It's important. But that didn't talk about Proposal A either, per se, but I think the fact that so many, did so many with the declining enrollment that the districts are losing revenue, and they don't have enough money. So that's, a, you know, it's not just Detroit that's losing revenue. Right. Dan, please. Uh, so, um, I, I think I, I guess I'm the the one set of language that we I, I don't know if we've gotten clear um, about in this conversation is in the paragraph right before the bullets. Um, Amy made a suggestion for language that she thought might have been consistent with what Kathy was driving at, but I don't know if it I don't know if it was. So I just want to. Make sure we note that so that we can get back to that if we need to in order to have enough clarity to, to have something to work with when we come back. Um, I would just join Kathy's uh, call for a um, discussion at some point on a future agenda about um, uh, the financing of education. Why don't we on the next agenda planning at least decide it when it would be on an agenda plan? Could we don't want to lose it at the next agenda planning mm -hmm. meeting, even though you may decide it's it's a May meeting as opposed to the next meeting. But we'll do that. Make sure we don't lose the place on it. Sound right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Other comments? Okay. And the action later today, or or if there is action, it's, there's a place on the agenda for it. Um, what's the pleasure of the board? Quarter to one. I think we need to do our. Well, we have a different suggestion to do. Mm -hmm. So, you pleasure the board go through. We don't have that many, so we could oh, go through. Well, that's what Marianne's oh, suggesting. Yeah. Well, if we're going to need to redo public participation at 1:30 plus, mm -hmm. no matter what, because people see it on the agenda and some newcomers mm -hmm. may come, I'm all for doing it 
if people want to do some now. Um, but just know, I, I'm sure we'll have to do some more or, or at least be open to it. So. The agenda calls for the 1.30, so people could walk in at 1.30 and you'd have to yeah. So we could we could take a break for 45 minutes or an hour now and do our discussion with Mike and then do public participation when people are more or less expecting it. So pleasure of the board, okay? I, I would support that. Yeah. Out of respect for people that are here, if you, right. you want to do try that? to do that, okay. get through the ones we have now. Okay, let's do it. There's, uh, I why have am I doing three that? and I know one. <laughs> I have three, and I know the first speaker is out of the room, so we'll go to the second speaker, who is John Love from Holly. Um, if you please come to the table, Mr. Love, to um, give us your well, comments. I don't want to ruin lunch. Let's see. <laughs> oh, we we can handle it. Um, the gentleman. <coughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Love. That I didn't see Mr. Buckley. Here, here. Here. Second to be. Yeah. Mr. Buckley, you were in the front. We missed you for a minute, but welcome to come up, sir. Eugene Buckley is our first speaker. Sorry for the confusion. He's from East Lansing. And let me remind the speakers that if you have some uh, materials to pass out, you can give it to somebody at the end of the table. Mr. Buckley has already given me his materials that I can provide to the board. And please have a seat, Mr. Buckley. You'll have five minutes to address the board, and as a matter of their bylaws, an item on their bylaws, they do not... Um, provide back and forth interaction to your comments. Very good. Just a second. Are you ready? Sure. Yes, sir. <coughs> uh, I retired last summer as uh, 35 years teaching economics as adjunct professor. Uh, if you don't recognize me, John Pollard and I sunk the Lansing school bond doggle. <laughs> Billion dollars for one school, 100 million into the pockets of contractors on no bid contracts, 200 million for schools that have since closed, and we'd still be paying that for 23 more years, $17,000 per household. I wrote my own proposal 20 years, $700 million. They could have replaced all 30 schools that they needed with brand new ones. We would already have had 10 with 500 construction. They had their bond issue. Patent yield cost twice as much as the original proposal. It's an architectural disaster, and they're still crying for more money. How bad are our schools? Well, since they kept everybody out of the war in Vietnam and started handing out diplomas for no work, we're in the third generation of empty diploma heads. Schools, industry, government, it's a disaster. We can't function anymore. We're turning out PhDs who are barely literate, MBAs with barely a high school education. FedEx made fun of MBAs in their TV commercial. CNBC said graduate engineers have less skills than a trade school graduate of 40 years ago. Microsoft has gone overseas, not for cheap labor, just there's no talent here to do their programming. With a year of accounting in 1963, 10 years ago, I beat out accountants and graduate accountants on an accounting test. Four years ago, they suspended me. They said I had set the academic standards too high and the students wanted an easier teacher. They told me years ago the three qualities of a great teacher, high instructor ratings, low dropout rate, no complaints. They never told me I ever had to teach anything in my classroom. Last summer I had a student, that was my last semester, graduate of uh, Sexton High School. And that's the one with less than 10% are college ready, by the way. Uh, he had a brilliant mind and great interpersonal skills, great potential for future. One of the other students saw his laptop and said he could barely write a complete sentence and couldn't hardly spell a word. That's what we're getting out of our schools. I have gotten some brilliant minds out of the Lansing School District, by the way. They're no slackers when it comes to potential talent. The results, we've lost millions of jobs. Lansing, all they want to do is raise our taxes. There's millions of dollars. They, don't even, they can't even see it. They could balance their budget. State of Michigan, I went to a meeting, and all I could talk about is raising taxes, reducing services, or barring against the future. When I suggest spending our tax money wisely, I got hooted out of the room. Feds are just as bad. Industry, they can't get any talent, so they went to Six Sigma, if you've heard of that. Uh, all it is is meetings and paperwork and bankruptcy. 
as we've seen with GM. By the way, GM could lower their operating costs here in Lansing by $100 million. They can't see it, and they don't want to hear it. But that's jobs. I noticed my students were mathematically challenged, so I had a question, subtract 9 from 6 on a test, 80% of them reach for their calculator. I went and wrote a tutorial for third grade multiplication, took it to the Woods Creek Wood Creek School for Math Scholars, the first comment, take it to the fifth grade, they can't do third grade math either. Any terrorist want to set this country down, just disable a mechanism that tells the cashiers how much change to give you at the register. The media swamps us every day, CNBC and Bloomberg, we need strict draconian educational reform. Half of all new teachers quit within five years because of low pay and poor working conditions, yet we want to lower the pay for, and benefits for teachers. Uh, Florida just lowered the educational funding and then gave everybody a tax reduction. You can't find a math and science teacher, <coughs> and now you want to pay less, excuse me. Four years ago, almost four years ago, I started writing an energy plan. It would make us energy independent in 15 to 20 years. We'd be driving hydrogen-powered cars that would get 5,000 miles in a fueling, zero emissions. Version 14 is out today, and you're getting the first copies here, by the way. It contains a school reform plan that I've been working on for years in my mind. It's now in writing. It's a draconian plan that you're not going to like but we'll never get any jobs here without complete and total educational reform. Sir, and you have 30 more seconds. We can balance the state budget just on, but prisons and uh, DOT. Businesses come here for profits, not tax breaks. Without an educated workforce, there'll be no profits. Everything for 40 years has been a disaster. It's time for change. Marva Collins, Joe Clark, and Michelle Ree proved you can take the worst of the worst and turn them into scholars three years in my plan and you'll be seeing significant results in turning our education system around. I guarantee you that. I left some uh, handouts that you could read. I urge you to and I have some extra copies of the plan for anybody else who might want one. I would be happy to give it to you. There's a bio on the third page. You were talking about money, madam. I can fix your problem. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to come back and present the whole plan to you. I'm headed for the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Love, you're next. Thank you. Can we get a copy of that one? Sure. Absolutely. Thanks for the presentation. Oh, yes. Thank you. If you're going to miss mine, I'll give you a copy of mine. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, I want to pass them out here. Just peel one off the top. Okay. And then. Uh, Here's a copy of the newspaper for the superintendent. Mr. Love, you, are you ready to go here? I'm ready. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> you know, Listening to this, I'm just thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a uh, some group that would uh, manage this uh, thousands and thousands of people that are uh, responsible for education in Michigan? And I was just wondering, well, where is that group? You know, at General Motors, you have a board of directors. You have people that are responsible for this thing. And here we have people that, uh, so the, I looked at the Constitution. It says there's 10 members on this board. Nine of them are here. Uh, they have the responsibility to plan and coordinate all education in Michigan. They have general supervision of everybody except the universities. And yet we're, the, we're, the legislature is going to make plans for us and figure it out? It's not going to work. The legislature doesn't know what they're doing anyway. What's the grade? Well, the grade for the people who are responsible for this is F, failure. Here's the newspapers. Grade fixing, test scores don't add up. Then I see the search committee for the uh, state, uh, for the superintendent of Detroit schools. The only person from Michigan is the communications director of the Department of Energy, Labor, and Economic Growth. Nobody from the State Board of Education. 
Why is that? They don't have general supervision. They should be involved in this. They should be an integral part of this. Well, I listed things that need to be fixed here. We need this Detroit project. We need a team. One super manager isn't going to do it. Bob lost a third of a billion dollars, and the school system is the worst in the United States. And the people that have the duty to take care of this is the State Board of Education. Secondly, we need to test all students to a standard, to some national standard or correction, so we can have a correction plan to fix it. Without data, you can't do anything. And we don't have that. We need to get input from the citizens in the schools. Any basic uh, service organization has a complaint department and answers the complaints. Take a survey and ask how we can help to improve the system. Where's the survey? I did a survey. I talked to my superintendent of my local school. And as a result of that, we need to use a CPA approach and standardize the money systems for paying their bills in their local communities so they can share. That's what my superintendent said. And then even the universities turn in budget requests to the state, and they aren't even commonized. They have a different one from every university, on top of which the University of Michigan has created their created campuses out of two of their universities and changed them into universities. These are campuses, not universities, and they aren't entitled to a separate appropriation. And uh, the basic uh, schools should have these payment programs. Then removing these non-functional uh, mental patients from the schools. We're, they're in our schools until they're 26 years old. The schools aren't, a, that's right money that's taken right out of the education fund and diverted to this uh, uh, babysitting operation that they've created and they aren't even uh, uh, paid by the government for the, this burden that's put on the schools. This is what my superintendent told me and I'm bringing it up here to present it to you to uh, get some sort of a resolution. Those are things that can be fixed now to improve the efficiency. I don't want to talk about cuts. That cuts is kid stuff. Improving the efficiency means reform and improving the efficiency. And you, this group is responsible for managing all these 550 school districts and 200 charter schools. It's an, un, it's an you can't do it the way it's organized. You're not organized to manage this system and that's the first change that you need to do. You have 57 intermediate school districts. The thing's a mess. They can't even communicate. You can't, if you sent something out today, if you said evacuate your buildings, it would take a week to figure it out how to get the message to anybody. So this is the, the challenge for you. You're the ones that are responsible for it. The buck stops right here. So here's some, I've given you some uh, uh, information to do it. Get a complaint department. They're complaining to one of the board members about they're smoking too much marijuana in the schools down in Detroit in the hallways, and they can't get their teachers can't get out to their cars without having them damaged. 30 so seconds left, sir. I'm all done. Okay. And we're all done. But you Thank need you. to do your duty. That's, the sim that's very simple. Thank you. Our next speaker is Russ Ballant from Detroit. Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Secretary, members of the uh, State Board of Education, at, a, <clears throat> uh, at my last presentation I, I made some comments concerning the uh, administration of the emergency financial manager. Uh, there were some uh, commitments I made to individuals of the board to uh, uh, put it in writing. Uh, there was also some comments about uh, allegations. Uh, not not being concrete, so I also wanted to make it concrete. I took those uh, concerns to heart, and I wanted to submit this as a matter of record uh, uh, as a perspective. Again, I'm a, a DPS, uh, parent of a DPS graduate, and I've been a DPS advocate for many years, involved, engaged in uh, differences of opinion and issues of improvement and reform at Detroit <laughs> Public Schools, and um, I continue in this vein with this report. Um, I wanted to uh, go past that, however, and talk today about some of the, leg the legislation that's being proposed and ask where the state board is weighing in on the question of the qualifications of an EFM for a school district. Uh, I think 
the uh, decision to ex expand the EFM's power to include academics was probably made in reaction to issues in Detroit, and the qualifications weren't changed to reflect that uh, additional responsibility. Uh, particularly, uh, I noticed the companion legislation in the Senate one, Bill 154 and the House 4215 gives the EFM the power for school redesign yet you search in vain for any qualification of the EFM to have even the rudimentary qualifications to engage that, that task. And so I wanted to prevail upon you to um, uh, perhaps formulate something that would uh, address that issue in the EFM language uh, in the, because th this obviously is intended to go beyond Detroit and it's going to be around for years. You'll remember, of course, that Public Act 72 was adopted in 1990. It was implemented in Detroit 19 years later. This, is, this has the likelihood of being around for many years, and the state, I'm hoping that the State Board of Education will address the inadequacy of, of, of that. Um, I'm not saying that because I otherwise endorse the legislation or its application in any district, and especially in Detroit. And what I thirdly and finally wish to uh, convey to you is that um, uh, the Detroit Public Schools, uh, the school board is conducting a search process for uh, uh, new leadership, and uh, the board is putting together a plan. Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, I'm not asking for the details. I'm waiting until it becomes public like everybody else. But they're asking for a, uh, putting together a proposal on how uh, the district can return to self-operation and self-governance. Uh, that includes uh, revenue sources. It includes uh, addressing the deficit as well as the academic issues. I want to suggest to you that if you evaluate what's happened in the last two years, which cries out for a reflection and evaluation, and I would re really support uh, a task force being created to really evaluate this one experiment of this one case study of how EFMs have worked in a Detroit in, in a school system. If you evaluate that, uh, then perhaps people won't so reflexively uh, reject the idea of going back to self-operation, with the understanding that there's always going to be uh, stringent oversight. And so I wanted to uh, uh, tell you that there is a search process going on for a superintendent, a COO, a chief academic officer. Uh, there is a search committee in place that includes uh, uh, persons from the colleges of education at Wayne State and in the University of Michigan and uh, many others. There's a search firm that's been engaged and I would uh, like to see the State Board of Education uh, Pay attention to that process, respect that process, and um, uh, be open to the initiatives for an alternative other than just the automatic and reflexive manner of putting a new EFM in place. Uh, if you were watching the news coverage of the recent uh, decision to bring in another, this next EFM into Detroit, you will see that uh, the candidate that was being considered uh, in the last week was somebody who had absolutely no background in education and no real background in government finance or public finance at all. And this is the decision to pull that nomination, as I understand it's, it's not being considered now, was a wise one because we can't go back and be somebody else's uh, experiment. We've got too many children in edu that are struggling and uh, need help and need support, and we need the best we have to offer, not personal relationships to decide seconds, who sir. the EFM is going to be, if there is going to be one. I encourage you to be open to the possibility that uh, a self-operation plan can uh, gain credence and would be better than anything that we've been going through the last two years and might go through uh, in the next two years if an EFM is in place. I appreciate your time, and thank thanks, you. Thanks, Russ. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris White. Good afternoon, everyone. This afternoon, Honorable President Austin, Superintendent Flanagan. 
I'm a Christopher White and other members of the Board of Education. I'm Christopher White, uh, co-chair of the Coalition Restore Hope to DPS. And uh, the reason why we're here today is because on February the 8th, 2011, we uh, delivered a request uh, for an investigation into the overall procurement and budgeting processes of the district under the current emergency financial manager, Robert Ba. We listed five uh, contracts that we felt would uh, lead one to go into a real investigation into the uh, procurement and budgeting and practices of the district. One being the Federal Education Law Group, uh, two of the uh, emergency financial managers, former uh, his current lawyers. The day after the emergency financial manager uh, signed his contract, March the 2nd, uh, 2009. On March the 3rd, these two individuals formed a company in Washington, D.C., and two weeks, three weeks later, they were awarded a no-bid contract. Uh, in addition to that, the $40 million Houghton Mifflin Hardcourt uh, no-bid contract that was awarded to them and only to find out that the current um, chief academic officer consultant, Barbara Burr Bennett, was a former employee of Holden Mifflin. So she left Holden Mifflin, came to Detroit, and they got the largest contract ever in the history of their company, and they've been in business for over 100 years. The third consulting contract that we had a problem with was the contract of Annette Knox, who helped develop the academic plan, which the uh, judge determined was not really, which was a violation of the law, under her current leadership, when she was in Camden, New Jersey, as superintendent, they had the largest cheating test scandal in the history of New Jersey. And this is one of the individuals who was utilized by the emergency financial manager to set up benchmark and goals for our, um, our uh, academic delivery in Detroit. And I understand that there is currently an investigation into the um, uh, alleged allegations of cheating on the meat. I think that uh, when you look at an individual like this that's working in Detroit, you can look for more uh, cheating scandals because they have a track record of that where they come from. First Student Transportation was another company that had, uh, in our document, we list that. They came into the district, they did a study of transportation, they called all the transportation providers together and got their information, told them that they were not going to bid on the, um, on the, on the contract, then turned around, issued an RFP, bid on the RFP and got the contract. And since they have a history of uh, sexual deviancy when it comes to uh, students, they also uh, have a history of untimely delivery of students. It even got to the point where a couple of weeks ago at the city championship, the uh, parents and, and, and people had to wait an extra hour and 35 minutes because they did not deliver one of the championship teams. In addition to that, uh, earlier this year, um, 26 schools uh, did not open on time because of their failure to deliver students. And in addition to that, uh, the district had to cancel all of its junior varsity games one day because they could not deliver their students on time to 18 schools. And the emergency financial managers wear this. They currently are not servicing several of our schools for field trips. And um, we believe that the lack of discipline or termination of this company, we want to know what's really going on. Uh, Sodexo, the other week, company that has the, uh, one of the worst human rights uh, records in the entire world and one of the worst civil rights records in the world, uh, has gotten a contract with um, DPS. We believe that these five, and, 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 and to piggyback off what the last speaker said uh, about the board being able to develop uh, a budget and so forth, that's the job of the current emergency financial manager. The processes and the uh, procedures and policies should already be in place. They should have worked alongside of the elected board, and we wouldn't have had a 50% increase in the deficit within the general fund. So, so um, we have asked for this investigation to take place. We received a letter, but we have to really get about the business of doing it. We have to have this investigation. That's, that's where we're at. Thank you. Thank you. I know we don't typically. Um, I do want to say that based on your request, we, we 
are trying to get a clear understanding from the Attorney General of our uh, our role in that. But one way or the other, I know the board's interested in getting it to the right place if it's not here. I mean, I know, for example, it's not with me. We got that determined early on by the Attorney General when it was first appointed. <coughs> the State Superintendent does not have authority over those contracts with the FM. We're still trying to figure out exactly who has that role and then on behalf of the board since you've come here you know appreciate your your bringing that to our attention we'll find out who the right party is if it's not this and it, it, it seems from our understanding so far uh, unofficially from the AG that it's not the board or the superintendent but we're committed to get that to the right folks to investigate and, uh, could I just add because the we appreciate Chris your and the other community residents bringing the material and asking us to see if there's anything that needs to be investigated. And we are, uh, as Mike said, um, and since it was addressed to me on the State Board President, we're asking the appropriate law enforcement investigation folks to help us determine who should be looking into this. So we, we appreciate your, your bringing this forward. Next speaker, Sandra Hines. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> First of all, I just want to kind of talk about what the speaker who came before Mr. White he said a lot of stuff that in essence is stereotypes. I know when people think of DPS, they think and when they think of the children, they think of thugs, children that's running around smoking weed, children that have their pants down, release their ankles. And all of that may be true because we know those are the kind of things that teenagers do in all ethnic groups. That's what teenagers do. They act strange. And um, so I just wanted to put that in the proper perspective that DPS is not like that. And if it is, it has just recently gotten that way. Um, because before the last maybe three to four to five, I say five years at the most, the district was doing a pretty good job. The um, thing I want to talk about is the board the school board that's been non-verbal um, on all these issues, well, because they have been non-verbal and somewhat complicit to what has gone on in terms of the dismantling of DB DPS by our emergency financial manager, which was sanctioned by the state, the former governor. And so when you look at this whole scenario of what's going on, it's a very, very big and broad picture of players as to why we are where we are and why we are at the table right now trying to sort this thing out. Now the people in Detroit we feel and we came up here last week in a number of thousands to impress upon the board that we do not um, agree with the legislation that is trying to be pushed through. Uh, 82, I mean 42, 14 to 18, we reject and oppose all of those bills that, are, that, they are, that someone is trying to pass. We feel that we have never been given an opportunity to be included. The gentleman who spoke before and talked about Detroit, and he seemed to be very passionate about it, I doubt if he lives in Detroit. And he's at the table talking about it. So again, Detroit is at the table being broken up in pieces and those who have the right price is able to pick and buy the one they want. Well, the, our children is, are just not for sale. Now, we know all these other players when it comes down to buildings and contracts and people see uh, Detroit as a cash cow. And it is. They always talk about we don't have any money. There's some money in Detroit. Because if it wasn't money in Detroit, everybody wouldn't be interested in trying to be in Detroit's business. And business is money. And so I'm saying that... Um, you know, the board, that's the thing I want you guys to kind of take a look at as to why is the board president making all of the decisions for the board to the point where now the board is not even functioning as a board, period, because of his, I would say, and it's only speculation on my part, I truly believe that he's in some kind of um, legal wranglings with Mr. Bob. And so I'm here to not only should this investigation be, be done to investigate what Mr. Bob is doing,
but also to investigate why the board is not doing their job. We the people in Detroit see that we have to consistently fight this giant monster that we up against. <coughs> But we're not going to give up because it's our children. People have gotten forgotten about why we all sitting here playing with this money. It's the children's money. The children are the ones that is going to suffer if they don't get an education. We already see where the tides are going in America. I don't need to sit here. Everybody in this room is highly educated and understand what's going on. And so I'm saying to you that can we get back to what's real necessary, and that's the education of our children. And we're saying to you, we're saying Detroit, not other people who come from other places and who used to live in Detroit, not them, but the people who live in Detroit. Can you listen to us as it relates to what we want for our children? 30 seconds, ma'am. So I'm, I'm, I think I'll end on that note. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I think this is the last one, and, and we've, we've tried to accommodate before 1.30 of these, but, but let's accommodate the, someone who walked in later. We should still accommodate at this point. John Anderson, please. Hello. My name is John Anderson. I'm from Okemos, Michigan, a graduate of Okemos High School, summa cum laude, went to the University of Michigan College of Engineering graduate of my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and my doctoral candidate in macromolecular science and engineering. Uh, I'm here because uh, I'm very concerned about the failure of our government in this state and this country. And I think any failure of government and constitutional failure necessarily implies a failure of education in this state and in this country. Uh, <coughs> I specifically want to get into the, the aspect of the failure to teach the law in Michigan. The idea that you can take AP chemistry, AP calculus, AP just about anything you can imagine, but you cannot get any sort of legal education in our high schools is ridiculous and absurd. The idea that people in Michigan do not need to know what their laws are and how to use the legal system is nonsense. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think we can break for, well, I think you have to move, have to actually. Call, yeah. Yeah. Page six. Is that for me to do? Yep. Okay. Um, or I can just go into it. You, there's something for you to read. Okay. I think we need to say what the roll call vote is for. Yeah, this, this is for an evaluation of the superintendent. That's why it was awkward for me to offer this, but I guess it's looking for a mo motion in a second that the state board convene in closed session uh, in order to consider a periodic personnel evaluation of the superintendent of public instruction as provided in Section 8 of the Open Meetings Act. So we would move and so support. Moved. Moved. Moved by John, supported by Richard. Um, and then we need a roll call vote. Austin? Yes. Dan Hoff? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Strauss? Yes. Albridge? Yes. Barner? Yes. Weiser? Yes. Siley? Yes. Motion carries. So we'll try to reconvene about our goal would be, I think it's 120 now. Pleasure of the president. At least a goal. 215. 215 at the latest. Okay. And um, there's, I think, uh, a way to expedite this for the board, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, 